Hello there. Thanks for watching or listening to VIP Boxing's Bell to Bell podcast. We're on episode 120. You know me, Steve Lillis. You know the man in the top corner next to me, John Evans. And I'm sure most people are watching because it is for diehards. They know the man at the bottom of the screen. He's dressed up for the occasion. John Pegg, ex-boxer, manager, trainer, promoter, whatever you want to call him. He does everything in boxing. And like last week's guest, Carl Greaves, he's up there with one of the hardest working men in the sport, for sure. How are you, John? Yeah, all good, Steve. All good. It's been a busy few weeks. Um, uh, had some good results. Had a, uh, a big show Saturday down in Birmingham. We had a 12-fight show, yeah, on, I was gonna, yeah. which was a real challenge, me and Tommy Owens. Uh, but no, it's all good. Got a few few bits of work to do. I've got, a, got to help out um, the McKenna brothers. Got to help out Peter Fury with Savannah in her total fights. Oh, yeah. And got a Niall Berry and Davy and Daniel have got fights, and then that's the season done for me. So I'm looking forward to a rest. Yeah, why did you do 12 fights Saturday? Because usually you're a real stickler for six or seven fights, and that's it. Um, because I realized that there hadn't been a 12 fight show in the Midlands since the pandemic. So basically, we were just showing off. <laughs> All right, and I'd say I'm not going to name the guy's name. Um, but I've heard you've got a kid on that bill who's a bit of a sleeper, but I don't want to start naming him in case you can't match him. But there you go. No, it was Ashley Hills. I don't mind yeah. saying he could be a good kid. I'm going to be trying to push him into title contention soon. He, he's, he, he's, he's a dark horse. Yeah. Um, hey, I feel like Dal Arrowsmith was that's... still feeling the effects this morning, I can promise you. Steve, cast your mind back to last Monday when you were trying to match Carl Greaves' show and John just reeled off 12 fights like that. Yeah, well, John's the king, isn't he? John's the king. <laughs> John, John's the king yeah, of this match, mate. He's the boss of it. You know, like you have the Don. You know, like, you know, <laughs> the Gotti family. You want to kill Floyd Mayweather. There's a king at the end of the, uh, head of the Gotti family who wants to. That's John to matchmaking. You message John. And that's it. He either says yes, no, and that's it. You don't is even it, argue. Is it like the wedding where John sat there and you all have to go in and ask him for favours? And... John, John's a don. You go in there and kiss. He has a big ring on. And you go and <laughs> No, it's me ring. asking for the favours. It's me asking for a 6 twos or something. Yeah, I'm I, the one asking for the favours. I tell you, you've got 12 fights the other night. I don't think, again, I don't think there was an overseas on. Was there, or was there one that I see? Two, two. Two. Two, yeah. That's not bad then. Two out of Two out of 12. Yeah. And you know what the worst thing was, Steve? Go on. A, a day after I booked both of those overseas guys, I got off at English guys, but I wouldn't do that to the agent. Even though there was a lot cheaper, I'd already booked them. So I honoured the deal. Do you know what I mean? But I could yeah. have had I could have had it all, all domestic. It's always the way it goes, isn't it, mate? Yeah. I said, we'll press on with this now then. John, you know how it works. Three minutes every round. John, you got your bell and all that sort of thing. All ready to go. Okay, you start us off, John Evans, and Tefimo Lewis is, Lopez is going to be comfortable in the chaos. Yeah, I tell you how good was Tefimo at weekend. You know, we, we were talking about that fight, and I I don't buy into all the talk before because some fighters operate great when everything's calm and stuff. Other fighters don't seem to be affected by chaos and stuff. But I just thought Taylor was going to wear him down and break okay. his heart and and just be a little bit much and. It may have been the weight, because Taylor may be 15 months beyond being a, a light welterweight. But take that off the table. I thought Lopez was brilliant. You know, he was sharp. He was quick. He was the puncher. He showed a chin. He was clever. Nothing Taylor did bothered him. He didn't tire. I, I just thought Lopez was really, really good and looked like the, the fighter we'd been missing for all this time. So, yeah, and after all the talk and all the hype and all the videos going around about him being in a mentally bad place last week. It just shows that if Tia Fimo's mind's actually on the fight, all the other stuff just doesn't seem to bother him, does it? Yeah, he's still, I don't know. I, 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 you still think, though, John, he's going to be one of these guys who's going to have erratic fights and erratic behaviour. Yeah. You saw that afterwards. Now he's saying he's retiring and stuff like that. But no, I thought he was better than what he was against Lomachenko. Yeah. I picked uh, Tyler to win as well. Yeah, I thought Taylor was just going to be a bit too big, a bit too focused. Uh, Lopez pulled it out. He might be one of those rare talents who can have a literal maelstrom going round in his life, but the boxing is his calm place. It's the place where he's happy. He seems one of them characters to me. Yeah. 
I just wonder if he might be another one of those as well who the better the fighter he's match with, the better we see Lopez. He might turn in stinkers against Sando Martin and people like that. But when he's really up against it and he's got someone he knows can hurt him, we see that Lopez because in his biggest fights, he's turned up, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And him and Haney, such a big fight now. Even the Lomachenko, too. Who knows? Yeah, Progre. Progre, that's the one, yeah. I tell you what, just before I'm going a bit off topic, I've noticed how Jack Hatchell suddenly not get mentioned again with all this super lightweight merry-go-round. I, I hope that's not a bad omen for what's happening. Um, what yeah. could happen to him? Um, round two, John, um, we're going to celebrate one one of your um, fighters, um, Sam Eggington. There's no substitute for experience, you say? Yeah. Yeah, well, basically, um, as everyone knows, a couple of weeks ago, we took Sam down to Bournemouth. He was basically being thrown to the walls with a kid with a 95% KO record. And Sam just doesn't let it bother him. He went down there. He used his experience. He used his calm head. He used all those, you know, I've tried to point out to people, Sam's had more 10 and 12 rounders than his opponents have had fights. And I says, it's going to be a difference. I says, once he gets past the first round, if you don't do anything silly, I says, this isn't going to be the fight of the year like you're thinking. I said, it's going to be a domination, really. I said it on Macklin's podcast. And uh, Sam just kind of showed how much he's got left in the tank. And it was really satisfying because a lot of people thought, not people in the game, most people in the game knew no, the experience would make the difference. But a lot of fans was like, oh, I'm worried for Sam Eggington. And I was like, oh, don't be worried for Sam Eggington. Be, be worried for fucking Joe Pigford. He's meeting a genuine bad motherfucker tomorrow night. Be worried for him. Don't worry about Sam, you know what I mean? And it was just so satisfying to see someone who's done it the proper way, who's learned his game, who's took losses and come back to kind of turn back the... The young, well, not even young, he's the same age, but the fresher knockout king. I was just very pleased about it, so I wanted to talk about it. Yeah, John, how does he stay so fresh? I can remember seeing him. Oh, God, where was it? It was in Hull on a Tommy Cole show against Shane Singleton. That must have been 2014. How has he kept so fresh? And, and you know, he's been to the world so many times, but remains fresh. He lives the life, Steve. He lives the life like you wouldn't believe. You know, he doesn't go out. He doesn't drink. His idea of a Saturday day out is taking his kids to the zoo. He lives the life. He trains. He doesn't do training camps. He doesn't wait to hear he's got a fight to get training. He's back in the gym. He's already been back in the gym, helping Savannah Marshall with sparring. And that's why he's had such a long career that a lot of people would have burnt out by now. He lives the life. It's as simple as that. He doesn't have no bad habits. He doesn't drink. He trains when he doesn't have to train. And that's, it's as simple as that. And as well, some people are just built different. Yeah. You know, some people are just built different. Jake LaMotta had 100 fights and was still doing comedy, to root, comedy routines at 75. He's one of them. I think he's just built a little bit different to normal people. But it was very satisfying for him to go there and do his job. It was a, a funny fight for him to take. I, I can understand why they took it, Pigford's lot. But I know Sam had a bad run a couple of years ago, John, didn't he? But where he was a bit off, a bit off it. Yeah. But even in the Hogan fight, you told, you came around and you told us he was just didn't like being away, did he? Like he wasn't settled over in Australia. Do you, do you know what? What? Do you, what do you think made him pick Sam at this stage in his career? Because he's looked good recently. Because people believe it when people keep saying, "Oh, he's got to burn out soon." Yeah. They forget he's 29 and he, he lives clean. They forget that, like, they say he takes a lot of stick and he has a lot of tough fights. But he's only been dropped once in 42 fights. It doesn't matter how tough you are. If you take as much stick as what people think Sam takes, you're getting dropped more than once in 42 fights. He's cleverer than he looks. And he's got, you know, he said on a podcast the other day, he said, I'm 29 and I feel really, really good. And I think his performance showed that. So, you know, after all these twists and turns with the Sam Eggington career, has he still got a few more ups and downs to entertain us with? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, Round three, um, Sonny Edwards. Um, I know you were there the other night, John. You can tell us what it was like there. But I'm just wondering, you got, we've got a real skilled operator here. 
and he must probably the best underground fighter in the world. It seems to me, although he's got this rep, you know, he's known on social media. You go to anyone in a pub or you know a casual fan, but they that they don't know him, and I think that's absolutely criminal. I mean, is it because of his style or, or why? You know, it, you know, is he? I know we're going to touch on this, I think, later on, John, on a topic. But is he one of these guys who no one's going to appreciate until he goes? Well, I think we brought him up a few um, episodes ago and we praised him up then because, again, a bit like we said about the results of Sam's, real boxing people appreciate Sonny Edwards. I, I, I love what he does. Yeah. I'm a big fan. I've been a fan since I took Brett Fido to fight him in his second fight. But I think he's cursed by the fact of his weight division. How many times has flyweight, super bantams, bantamweights been criminally ignored for big fat heavyweights? You know, we've seen it. Who knows about the Galaxy Brothers, but they know about Greg Page and Tony Tubbs. You know what I mean? It's happened all the way through. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, look at look how long it took someone as good as Chocolatito to be even acknowledged by boxing fans, let alone a person on the street. They'll never have heard of little Chocolatito. So Sonny Edwards, he's bang up against yeah. it. But yeah. I, I thought he made it more entertaining than normal at weekend. I thought he chose to stand and trade and... Uh, not stand and trade, that's the wrong way of putting it, isn't it? But he was doing a bit of your go, my go with his camp. Austin. For six rounds, I thought it was quite entertaining. Then Sonny just got on his bike and and sucked all the drama out of it, didn't he? And you, exactly what you said, Steve, I, the fans don't appreciate, the fans were there for Johnny Fisher. Yeah, uh, John Fisher's crowd, there. And and to me, and, and I mean this with great respect to John, because, you know, they're not moving him on because they know he's the one that sells tickets there. Sonny doesn't sell tickets, unfortunately. But so, but that does mean that Sonny's going to have to be put in big fights now. And he's game for it, isn't he? Sonny will fight anybody. So, fingers crossed, he, if he gets a signature win, a big fight, maybe against Bam Rodriguez, maybe all of a sudden he'll break through and people will start acknowledging him. Yeah. Right, round four. We're over to you again, John, and the, heavy, the young heavyweight. Yeah, Johnny Fisher bought this up because that was a shambles on Saturday night. Um, he, he got abs he got a training camp out of it, didn't he? He got nothing in the ring. Uh, guy didn't want to be there. We had Adelaide, who I actually thought looked all right at York Hall. Probably a higher calibre opposition, but Adelaide looks pretty good doing what he does. And this weekend, we've got Fraser Clark against Marius Back in an eight-rounder where I think we could all write a script for it now, couldn't we? But it's a yeah. good fight for Fraser to get his eight his rounds in. But I think once these once Clark's got back out of the way, I think it's time we need to see him fight each other, don't we? I know we've had all this to and fro in with a British title, but they're all only going to benefit from fighting each other and going in with someone who's going to try and beat them. I think they're all at that stage now where we need to see tests. Fisher's a little bit further down the line, and he's selling a lot of tickets, so he's going to be bought slower. But Adelaide, Wardley and Clark, it, it's time now for him to go into someone who's going to try and beat him, I think. But you know what? It didn't do... Dillian White and Anthony Joshua any arm fighting for the British title, did it? Didn't no. affect their career earnings or their future chances, did it? Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, you want you I, I, to me, Adelaide Clark is the one I'm surprised hasn't insisted he, he's moved on. I remember when he was an amateur, he famously, well, not famously, he made a comment about being at the top of the tree, fighting the best after five, six fights, almost going down that Joe Joyce route. And I think he could have done. I mean, after Joe Parker got fought, got beat by um by Joe Joyce, I thought that was the time for him to even fight a Joseph Parker. Yeah. Well, and uh, do you know what? It's not like the heavyweights have got loads of age either. Does is it? Yeah, They're no. all kind of like touching thirty plus, yeah, so they right. don't they don't need to be hanging around really. Clark and Joyce were in wars together for years, weren't they? That's because right. It's not as if the gap between them was so big. I, I don't think there's any need for Clark to be brought along so slowly. And people like Solomon Dakers, who can really fight, they're just almost not even talked about. I mean, they're completely forgotten. There's such a scene that could be coming along if we all just mixed it up. A loss doesn't matter. British fighters are going to dominate heavyweights for years, aren't we? Because he's, there's no one else coming from anywhere apart from Eastern Europe. So just get them in together. We'll all be better for it in the long run. Totally agree. We're on five, then we're on to now. John, the drunken master. You, you, you're going to wax lyrical over. 
Yeah, I want to talk about Emmanuel Augustus purely because he's one of my favourite fighters. Um, often we get asked our top 10 pound-for-pound pound fighters, and I always insist on doing a top 10 pound-for-pound pound favourite fighters. And Emmanuel Augustus is always in my top four or five. You know, I cannot go past one of his videos, no matter how many times I've seen it, without stopping, clicking on it and watching it. You know, imagine if this guy would have been took in by a, a, a promoter, a trainer or a manager who, who wanted to do something. I've, you don't see the skills he's got on top, top level guys. You know, he gave Floyd Mayweather his hardest fight. He had a fight of the year with um, Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward so he won that, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't just slippery and clever and smart. He could also throw his gloves down and have a war with Mickey Ward. And Manuel Augustus, for me, like I say, if I see a th- like something with one of his videos on, I stop and watch it, and then I go and find some more and watch them again. It's just a tragedy that someone didn't fight him, uh, find him and, and do something more with him. And like, even in retirement, the geezer got shot in the head and should yeah. have died. And he fought his way through that. I just, he's just a character for me that I can't believe there hasn't been a film. If they make a film and done his life story how it is, people would say, oh, we've had enough of this bullshit. Do something realistic. He's for, yeah. I just think he's amazing. And yeah. I just wanted to talk about him because I think guys like him deserve to be talked yeah. about. You know what? I remember I used to go to America a lot more in the 90s and he's fights and um, um, would be previewed in, you know, he'd be fighting some name coming up and, and even boxing news in the nineties would call him a journeyman and a gatekeeper. And it was I said to you today, John, when we used to mention this as a topic, he's another one that was only appreciated in retirement. And when you mentioned him, I looked at his record quickly today, and was it almost eighty fights? I think it was four men with losing records he fought in eighty fights. Yeah, mate, what about when someone made the mistake of bringing him over for John Faxton? That's John. I was going to say. The first time I saw him was in the good old days of 90s boxing on Sky, when he came over and he was called something different. He was called... Emmanuel Burton. Emmanuel Burton, Burton that's it, yeah. And he came over and did Thaxton. But he boxed everybody. He even boxed good forgotten fighters like Antonio Diaz and Kendall Holt. He boxed them all, didn't he? And he was Co- so Courtney talented. Burton, Ray yeah. Oliveira. And Ray not Oliveira. just like fought him, he danced in front of him. He yeah. danced. And then when they missed him, he punched him and then yeah. laughed and danced his way back to the corner. He was just an unreal talent that was allowed to just do whatever he wanted. I just wish someone would have got hold of him. He, I honestly believe the right coach got hold of him. He could have been like an all-time great. You can't dance around in front of Floyd Mayweather when your training is consisted of four spliffs and a sleep on a bench beforehand. <laughs> and he did. You know what I mean? Yeah, brilliant. That was a lovely, was ra- lovely talk about him. That was lovely, John. And uh, you know what? Yeah, it was great. You know, yeah, it's a shame that so many people recognised him. Not you, obviously, after retirement. Um, round six, final round. We had the Hall of Fame this weekend. Carl Froch, great to see him get initiated into that gang. Where I don't know whether it, whatever happens there in in Canasota in upstate New York. But I just wondered what British fighters who aren't in there, you guys fought should be in there. I'll, I'll give you Duke McKenzie. Absolutely. Duke um, McKenzie's not in there. Don't oh. think he is. No, he's not in there. Wow. Rick, Ricky Hatton, I'd have in there because of the popularity. You know, it wasn't just yeah. the box. It's what you did for the sport as well, I think. You know, I think it's criminally overlooked. Dennis Andrews in the Hall yeah, of Fame. Um, you know what? And three-time world champion, you know, come back from that horrible defeat against Thomas Hearns. I'll never forget when he won the title for the second time. He went over to America and beat Tony Willis and... Stopped he, him in seven rounds. That's right. Yeah, it was six or seven. He come back and he had to get... He was so unrecognised that Heathrow, he got the subway, the underground train, back to Walls Hackney. Whereas four he days later... He was in a paper bag. That's right. He belting a brown paper bag. And, and somebody asked him, what if someone tried to take it off you? And he went, who's going to take it off me? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what Dennis said. And four days later, Frank Bruno got hammered by Tyson in their first fight and came back a hero. I think Dennis yeah. Andrews, I know he never wanted the fame, never wanted the interview. I've got nowhere, no one truly knows where he is now. 
But I just sit, most people think he's around Hackney and he's never seen. Criminal that he's not in the Hall of Fame. Is there anyone that you two guys who are, should be in there? British. I agree with I agree with um I agree with Andrews with you. And I uh, who was your first one? Duke. There, Duke. Duke McKenzie. Duke yeah. McKenzie, I can't believe he's not. Ricky Atten, I think, will get in there, but not quite yet. I think maybe a few more years. Uh and I think maybe there's a shout out there for for um, who's the guy that the Irish guy who, who Duke McKenzie took the title off? Dave McCauley. What a good shout! No, Dave McCauley Just, beat Duke, didn't he? Um, yes, no, that's it. Sorry, that's who I meant. No, yeah, who beat, that's yeah, it. beat Duke. I have a flyweight Duke, title at Wembley, five yeah. rounds. I think I was Look there. Look at the fonts he had with Rodolfo Blanco, Blanco. and uh, and who was the, uh, the 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 Colombian who stopped him in thirteen rounds? Yeah, he had um, down about five times. Yeah. Fidel oh. Bassa. Fidel Fidel Bassa. Bassa. And you know what? He beat baby Jake Matlala. Yeah, but you know who, he's probably in there. Yeah. And he knocked him out in 10 rounds. So Ricky Ann, I think, will get in there eventually. But I agree with two of yours totally. But I'd put Dave McCauley above Ricky Ann. That's a great shout. John, anyone? You... Well, Duke, Duke McKenzie is ridiculous, isn't it? Um, oh, we've nothing... already said him, John. You can't yeah, pick our two. We've already said him. Hatton would have, if Hatton had had one big performance in America, apart from Castillo, who was a bit faded, I think Hatton would have been in by now. But do you know what? I named my dog after him. He's my favourite British fighter, Lloyd Hunnigan. He yeah. bashed up Donald Curry. He was already a British Commonwealth European champion. Listen to his run of fights. Donald Curry. Maurice Blocker. Johnny Bumfus. Maurice Blocker. Gene Hatcher. Jorge Vacker. He beat them all. He beat them all one after the other, after the other, after the other. Then also, he went off the rails. Let's, not forget, off let's not forget, before Donald Curry, he beat Gianfranco Rossi, who had That's such a long yeah. reign at light middle. He knocked him yeah, out in three out, rounds for the Europeans. Knocked him out in three. Roger Stafford. Yeah. Sylvester Mitri, Horace Shufford. He knocked them all out one after the other, after the other. You know, you know, I, I, thought, saw, I, I can't saw... believe he's not in there either. No, that's yeah. a great shout. And you know, I, I remember seeing. Give him Hunnigan one of his hardest nights, and he gave him two fights, I think. One of them from Cliff the mid Gilpin. Cliff Gilpin of the Albert hey. Hall. Cliff Gilpin from Telford, Lenny, from Lenny Telford. Woodall's fighter. Yeah, that's it. He gave him a really, I think he really pushed him close in one of those fights. I'll tell you another oh. Midlands guy who gave him a good fight, Lloyd Ibbett. Lloyd Ibbett, good fighter. Oh, Lloyd oh, Ibbett gave him a good I, fight. Billy, oh, I, I was talking, Billy. Graham always tells me a story about Lloyd's last fight when they were in the dressing room and uh, he was just sat on his own and he was being served up to Adrian Dodson. That's it, yeah. He said it, it was so sad, you know, seeing Hunnigan like that because he, he didn't really want to be doing it at that point. And he said he looked scared and Hunnigan was scared of nothing, was he, in his prime? And uh, I, I don't know why Lloyd gets overlooked. Maybe it's because of the way he is these days. He's, I believe he's hard work, isn't he? Yeah. But yeah. That, that run You're of fights... Right. If anything, any British fighter's done. God. Well, do you know what? Um, Barry McGuigan got in there, and I agree with that, but Lloyd's run of fights was better than Barry's. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, yeah. I agree. He no, just gets, I, I'm oh, shocked that Lloyd's not in there. I'm shocked he's not in there. Yeah. He, well, he, gets, he gets written off as being all this great upsetter who did Donald Curry when he was a no-hoper. And that's not right, is it? He was a good fighter, yeah. took Curry apart and kept his run going. Yeah. Beat, beat a few more world champions after that. Yeah. Now, remember the Johnny Bumpus one? Was that the one where it was in the ball ring? The went ding and he went dong. Yeah, no, was... Gene, Gene Hatcher was the ball Gene ring. Hatcher... Johnny Bumpus was... The bell went but... ding and I the went dong. The bell went there. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Lord, Lord was over. He was past halfway in the ring when the bell went and he flattened yeah. him, running. Yeah, I think that was um the ball ring one, Gene Hatcher, the night Frank Bruno. Gene Hatcher, Chuck 40, 40 seconds. Yeah. 40 yeah. seconds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fellas, it's been great catching up with you tonight. We've got to run out of time on this. John, thanks as always for coming on, mate. Um, have a good summer break. I know you've got a mad few couple of weeks still coming up. Have a good good break. John, thanks very much. John Evans, as always. Speak to you in the week. And Mr. Peg, thank you. And I say, enjoy your break, mate. And thanks, everyone, for listening. See you soon, chaps. For all boxing, info, news, and latest interviews, amateur and pro across and off, Click and subscribe. VIP boxing promotions. Also, 
Twitter, Instagram and Facebook.